I want to talk about the spread of what are called Indo-European languages. Uh, about the time of the American Revolution, a British jurist in India noticed and started writing about uh, the similarity of words um, from, from Ireland, from the Celtic languages, all the way to uh, Pakistan and northern India. Shared words across um, a whole range. And it, it's easy to find lists of these. Um, we say God the Father, we say Deus Pater from Latin. The Romans said Jupiter, it's the same word. In uh, Sanskrit, uh, it's used Pitar, something like that. Again, the same word, the same ideas um, across uh, half of Eurasia. Uh, these languages, and we can trace the ancestry of languages in the same way we can uh, trace uh, uh, trees of descent of genes, um, by most accounts originated in the steppes north of the Caspian and Black Seas, so-called Pontic steppes. About 6,000 years ago, um, there was this massive eruption, expansion of Indo-European speaking people uh, who within a few thousand years uh, were all the way from Ireland to uh, uh, Mumbai. Uh, it's, it's an amazing uh, event. We know of other important expansions of people. Um, most of them that we know about, the, the ba expansion of Bantu-speaking people into southern Africa, uh, other expansions seem to have been done by agriculturalists. You have a new food source, you have a lot of food, population grows and boom. Uh, the expansion of Europeans into the New World was uh, a company that was done by germ warfare, essentially, not consciously, but uh, by uh, the immunological competence of Europeans to uh, old world diseases that were fatal to the inhabitants here. Uh, but what on earth um, accounts for this? Well, here's a map of the Indo-European world uh, 500 years before the Common Era. Um, the, the green on the, uh, on the west are Celtic speakers. So when Caesar was uh, uh, doing his Gallic Wars, he was uh, fighting Celtic speakers. They were later chased to Ireland uh, by the Germanic tribes pushing behind them. If we go all the way to the east, uh, TOC, are Tocharians. Uh, these were inhabitants of the Tarim Basin of China. Um, today, that's part of China. Uh, 2,500 years ago, uh, the people uh, uh, looked like they could have come from Ireland. For example, here are two Tocharian monks. This is from what is now Western China in the ninth century of the Common Era. The fellow on the right uh, looks like he, we could find him in China today. Uh, the fellow on the left, red hair, blue eyes, he, we, he, he looks like someone who wandered out of an Irish bar. Uh, but this is, uh, this is the furthest eastward push of Indo-Europeans. Uh, today, uh, in that part of the world, we find people called Uyghurs. Uh, here's a bunch of them. Uh, genetically, they are uh, essentially, the, where was their DNA a thousand years ago? Half of it was in uh, Europe and half, no, 3,000 years ago, half of it was in Europe, half of it was in uh, East Asia. Um, and well, Indo-European um, shares lots of words and it shares core words. Uh, numbers are the same. Uh, body parts 
Uh, Indo-European languages share words for oak, beach, wolves, bears, salmon, snow, but they don't have shared words for grapes, uh, wine, figs. Um, it's a very clear signature in shared language of the origin of these people. Uh, Proto-Indo-European, the reconstructed ancestral language, has lots of words for milk. Proto-Semitic, the ancestral language of the civilizations of the Middle East, doesn't have any words for milk. They had, there were horses, sheep, cattle, pigs, goats, copper, but not iron. These are, this is pre-Iron Age. Carts, weaving. The weaving of the Celts in France in Roman times is nearly identical to how it was done in the Tarine Basin by those Tacarians. Uh, these were uh, warriors. These were raiders of the plains um, with patrilineal clans, uh, wolf totems, young male warriors, uh, very familiar from uh, folklore and fiction. They were pretty backward. At the time that they were expanding and uh, uh, occupying half of Eurasia, the Sumerians had uh, the wheel, they had writing, arithmetic, cities, irrigation systems. This was the center of civilization in, in the Middle East, in the uh, Fertile Crescent. North of them, all these uh, PIE cowboys had domesticated the horse, but not much else. All right, now for a uh, uh, one minute history of Europe, Um, about 35 to 45,000 years ago, uh, modern humans, people that look like us, uh, occupied Atlantic Europe. And we call these the, the foragers or the hunter-gatherers. Then, shortly after 10,000 years ago, farming spread from the Anatolian Peninsula there this way and spread as a kind of concentric waves of advance across Europe. So we have foragers at 40,000, uh, farmers at 8,000. For years in human genetics, the argument has uh, raged about whether modern Europeans are mostly descended from the farmers or the hunter-gatherers. Uh, the recent genetic data suggests none of the above, neither one. Uh, most European genome seems to be descended from someone else. Um, but about 4,000 years ago, archaeologists speak of old Europe, and this is old Europe, just across the Bosporus from the Anatolian Peninsula. Uh, old Europe was these Europe's first farmers. They lived in dispersed settlements. Uh, no palaces, the elite lived the way everyone else did. Um, and let me say something about the significance of dispersed settlements. If you fly over rural Iowa today, you'll see farms with farmhouses, and the farmer and his family lives on his farm. If you, not so much today, but a few hundred years ago, flew over Italy, you'd see fields in farms, but the farmer and his family lived in a walled town uh, on a hill somewhere, or perhaps an easily defensible island. When there are bandits around, you can't live like you do in Iowa. Um, the first farmers in Europe were like farmers in Iowa. They were living in dispersed, very nice settlements. These, this is some of their pottery, beautiful stuff, sculpture. This is long before the pyramids. Uh, nice jewelry, but 
that whole, their whole system was trashed. It was destroyed. Uh, someone came, burned all their farms down. The place was, looked abandoned for a while. And when they rebuilt, they rebuilt, they rebuilt in walled towns on hilltops and on defensible islands. Something had come and trashed this apparently wonderful place. Oh, okay, so there's some gold jewelry of these uh, uh, early European farmers that, uh, as our best guess is, the Indo-Europeans uh, destroyed. So what was going on at this time uh, north of the Fertile Crescent, north in the plains of central Eurasia? Well, here's one imaginary version of it, Ovid among the Scythians. Uh, somebody milking the horse for lunch. Uh, today, uh, here are some people from the same region milking a horse. Now, if you look at a map, what jumps out at you is that the distribution in space of Indo-European languages is the same as the distribution of that 13910 uh, lac lactose tolerance mutation that Sarah was just speaking about. It's, it's just real clear, it's the same mutation, the same mutation in an Irishman or a Pashtun in Afghanistan, uh, common descent. Um, the map is trying very hard to tell us that they spread together, but, and, and we know from other uh, evidence that, that Sarah summarized, that there's a tremendous selective advantage to lactose tolerance. What is it? Uh, your physician will talk with you about lactose tolerance, but his concern and yours is, uh, you know, flatulence, because if you can't digest that lactose, something else does, and you get diarrhea, and it's quite uncomfortable. But is that a big selective advantage? Well, I have my doubts, but if we take a look at milk, uh, there are some pretty important energetic uh, phenomena here. A liter of cow's milk has 250 calories from lactose, 300 from fat, and 170 from protein. Now, if you're not lactase persistent or lactose tolerance, they're synonyms, whether or not you get gas, you don't get those 250 calories. So, this mutation um, is like a magic pill that increases your food supply by 40%. Because suddenly milk, uh, you get those calories from lactose and you have a big advantage over the kid in the next house that doesn't get those calories. These were Populations, Malthusian populations, uh, subject to lots of warfare, raiding, uh, drought, famine, uh, hungry children are an ugly thing to see. Uh, but if uh, times are bad and this child has the magic pill, 13910, uh, has 40% more calories than the others. Just, I think must be the basis, the ecological basis of this advantage of lactose tolerance and of this uh, spectacular eruption of people. Well, what most people in the world have to do if they're gonna live off milk is turn it into cheese. You ferment it, ferment away the milk sugar, um, and then it doesn't bother you to try to digest it but you've lost the energy. So if you take a liter of milk, turn it into 100 grams of cheddar cheese, uh, you've lost 45% of the energy, and energy is the critical nutrient in uh, low-tech human societies. Well, cattle came across Anatolia with the first farmers, turned around uh, uh, and started moving uh, east again, but it ne they never got much past the Urals. Um, these Indo-Europeans 
seem to have come from mostly from the east of the Urals and by all archaeological evidence and all accounts they were horse people, not cattle people. Uh, I have to back up. Uh, this is a southern uh, African Bantu speaking woman, a group called Herrero, um, who lives on milk, something like 80, 90 percent of the diet is milk, uh, no lactose tolerance at all. That gourd is full of milk. She's making buttermilk. Um, when the buttermilk, when the lact lactose is gone, there's this horrible tasting stuff in the gourd that's a staple of the diet. No lactose in it. It doesn't poison people. At any rate, back to early Indo-Europeans, a kilo of mare's milk has 190 calories of fat and protein, 250 from lactose. Uh, a mare will yield about five kilos a day. Uh, that will feed two lactase persistent children and about eight tenths of one non-mutant child. Tremendous difference. It's as if there's two children here and everybody gets a quart of milk and this child gets a quart of milk and he doesn't have the magic pill and he gets 400 calories or whatever. This child has the mutation. Instead of a quart, the child is getting two and a half quarts of milk. Spectacular increase in ability to extract food from the environment. And what's important about this, the last point I'll emphasize is that th these people had a biological advantage. And as they moved and invaded, the invadees couldn't steal it. If an advantage is just technology, uh, it spreads to the invadees and uh, uh, is not a persistent advantage. George Custer learned this at the Little Bighorn. Um, but a biological advantage uh, can't be uh, uh, stolen. And thank you very much. <laughs>